Let's go to God in prayer. Father, please quiet my thoughts as you speak through me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, just so you know, there is a method to my madness. Um, on the bulletin covers, the last few times I've preached, I've had something a little bit different than probably uh, what most people would expect to see on a bulletin. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because uh, I've recently been rereading Dr. Tim Elmore's leadership books. And the one thing that he says to do is to always have a visual that can lock an idea in a person's head. So this is your visual, a die-hard battery, and we'll see how we can work that into our uh, message today. Well, it was 1963, Maundy Thursday, my first day off of uh, Easter break. And uh, my dad had pulled his 1957 Ford Galaxy out into the driveway in the morning for me to wash. And it was a beautiful car, and I, I dreamt of owning that car once I got my license, even though I was only 11 at the time. Um, Two-tone blue, he had it specially painted. Just a beautiful car. And uh, so I washed it in the morning, and that afternoon, um, he said, why don't we wax the car? So we worked together. I never really waxed the car on my own, so he taught me uh, how to do it. The reason we were doing this is we were preparing ourselves to take a trip up to Marquette, Michigan, the first time my family had ever been up to the Upper Peninsula. The reason we were going is my father's youngest sister, my Aunt Mary, had recently uh, eloped. Uh, she ended up marrying one of her college professors. And since my dad was the oldest in the family, he was kind of sent up there to check and to just make sure everything was uh, copacetic. So uh, uh, over lunch that day, uh, before we went out and waxed the car, uh, my parents had a conversation and my dad said, you know, the car's seven years old and we're going on this long trip, we're going up to Marquette and who knows, there's still maybe snow on the ground up there. So I think I should invest in a new battery. Now the one thing you need to know about my father is he was a, a fan of Fords. Uh, he never owned anything but a Ford. He worked for Ford Motor Company. The second thing is my dad just loved craft, craftsman tools. And so uh, the Die Hard battery had just uh, debuted that year. And so my dad said, I think I'm going to invest in a die-hard battery because this was a battery that was guaranteed for life. So he took, uh, took our 57 Ford uh, over to Lincoln Park to the Sears, uh, drove it in, and had a new battery installed. When he brought the car home, he pulled it into the garage because my mom, and I don't know if this was because she had a bookkeeping background, but my mom was the master packer. And she knew, much like my wife is, she knew exactly uh, every nook and cranny in that car, where to put things, because we were going to be gone about a week and a half. And uh, being that my aunt just got married, my mom had some extra things around the house that she figured uh, they could use uh, setting up uh, their apartment uh, up near northern Michigan uh, University. Marquette University. So um, the car was packed. Good Friday, we got up, we were ready to go. And the only thing that wasn't in the car was the cooler. Uh, my parents always put the cooler in the back seat between my sister and I so we wouldn't fight on, on our trips. Uh, so we, we got the, the cooler in the back. We were in our seats. My dad turned the key. This is the beginning of a short story about my family's first adventure to the UP. And it's somewhat congruent to reading the Sermon on the Mount. 
Jesus gives us directions for how to successfully live in his kingdom right now. While we have already learned about the Beatitudes and will be spending the next few months unpacking the details of what many people call the greatest sermon ever preached, today I want to introduce you to the plans and disciplines that Jesus has in store for us in order to prepare for this journey that we call life. Proverbs 10, 17 states, he who heeds discipline shows the way to life, but whoever ignores correction leads others astray. I also will attempt to illustrate how God will activate us to perform the deeds on this journey. Matthew 5:16 states, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Jesus taught the Beatitudes, or blessings, recorded by Matthew and Luke, that will produce hope and joy, even when we are being persecuted. Joy, if you remember from another sermon that I presented earlier this year, is that steady feeling of peace that comes in times of great success or great defeat. It's a feeling of contentment without outrageous, prideful highs or depressed sinking lows that pull us away from our God who calls us his children. Jesus promises us the kingdom of heaven now in which wealth and power are unimportant and replaced instead by humility and self-sacrifice. As Jesus continues, he tells us that one, we can have a positive or a negative influence on the earth and, in, and its inhabitants by our actions or inactions. Two, obeying the law is more important than being able to explain it. Three, we must be open to transformation so that Christ can change our hearts and attitudes. Four and five, anger is as serious as a, as serious a matter as murder, and lust is as serious as adultery. Six, Christians must be trustworthy and solid in their decisions. Our yes must mean yes, and our no must mean no. Seven, while non-Christians love those who love them back, Christians must even love those who hate them or who are mentally or physically unable to love them back. Eight, we need to give, pray, and fast without fanfare. Nine, we must not let our stuff or money become our God. Ten, while planning is time well spent, worrying is not only a waste of time, but it's a waste of our resources. Eleven, approach the sins of others cautiously and with care, and only after much prayer and discernment, remember, remembering that it is up to God to judge a person's heart. Twelve, spend only a short time with a sinner, but ask God for discernment to know when it is time to end a relationship with a non-repentant person. 13, ask God for what he would have you to do. 14, condemn those who purposely teach false doctrine, knowing full well of their misteachings. And finally, 15, be faithful and God will reward you. Beware that God will cut down religious people who have rigid hearts of stone. So, as my father turned the ignition on the Ford Galaxy, I expected to hear the roar of the big V8 that he had in that car. And instead, all we heard was a click, click, click. The new diehard battery that he bought was defective. So he went to the next door neighbor and asked Pat if uh, he could get a ride up to Sears, take the battery with him, and get a replacement. Even though we were fully prepared to go on this trip to uh, Marquette, we had everything packed, my mom had all of the maps marked out, we had the AAA trip tech, we were set to go, we didn't have any power. So it often is the same for Christians. We are fed the word, read the Bible, are involved in small groups, pray, 
attend workshops, concerts, and Christian events, place a fish on our cars and a cross on our walls as we simply allow ourselves to become full, content, and lazy. Like that diehard battery, we become defective and lose our charge overnight. Matthew 22, 37 through 40 states, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And Matthew 28, 19 shows us, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants us to love him, our neighbors, and to make disciples, baptize, and teach people from all tribes and nations. Did you hear that? Love, make, baptize, and teach. Those are all verbs, action words. Jesus has already given us directions for living in his kingdom now. But Jesus did more than that. As the perfect teacher, he also modeled the actions that he wants us and his disciples to take. Jesus showed us that miracles do happen. He also modeled how to test potential disciples so that we spend time with those who are called by God and wisely focus our time on those who are repentant and willing to give of themselves. Remember the model that Jesus used when he examined the rich young ruler? in front of his disciples, he said, as told in Luke 18, 29, I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus then allowed the disciples to experiment he first sent them to their own, the Jews, to practice healings and to attempt to preach his message that the kingdom had already begun in the hearts of believers and would be fully recognized when Jesus returns. He also told us and his disciples to expect persecution. The world wants to dodge the truth. 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 13 states, in fact, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Jesus then modeled preaching to the crowds, as well as showing us that we will face conflict with those who call themselves religious and caught up with the man-made rules and traditions that only draw attention to those who are involved in the ceremonies and rituals. Jesus quoted a verse written by the prophet Isaiah, and this is from Isaiah 29, 13, in which he said, The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. Our Lord then taught after ascending the Mount of Olives and foretold the future. While we don't know every detail, Scripture attempts to give us a glimpse of what will be when Christ returns. So after three years of modeling and allowing his disciples to experiment, Jesus shows us the ultimate form of servant leadership. He lays down his life for us, knowing full well that he was going to pay the ultimate sacrifice of taking on the wrath of God that was intended for all of humankind. Jesus dies. But fortunately for us, the story does not end there. Jesus overcame death and was resurrected, offering us eternal life as well. Reading John 6, 51, Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, which means to accept Christ and be united with him, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world.
Well, my dad ended up uh, taking that battery back to Sears and came home with a new one, hooked it up, we all got in the car, he turned the ignition, and the mighty V8 started up. And we uh, ended up taking our 12-hour trip up to, uh, up to Marquette. Uh, two years later, my father sold that uh, Ford Galaxy to the neighbor across the street, transferring the uh, battery warranty to him. After Jesus was resurrected, he then promised to send his own spirit to live within his followers. But he also gives each of us, not just pastors or deacons, elders, those with a gift for evangelism, he gives all of us a job to do. The message of salvation is meant to be shared with everyone in every nation. Jesus wants us to proclaim this message, that is, to share the gospel with our actions, that is, to love them, with our words, that is, to teach them, and with our deeds, that is, to make disciples. We aren't chosen by God to become like that diehard battery that became defective and lost its charge overnight. Acts 1.8 states, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The good news is that God himself has empowered us through the Holy Spirit to be his representatives. Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. This union is initiated in the sacrament of baptism. It's kind of like God placing within us a new diehard battery. In a few moments, we will celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper confirms and sustains this union of the Holy Spirit within us. This is much like when my dad took the diehard battery back to Sears to have it re-energized. We never have to worry about the Holy Spirit leaving us. Jesus ended the giving of his great commission with, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we have the lifelong guarantee from the creator of the universe that he lives within us and he will ever sustain us and that he has enabled us to go out into the world to love, baptize, and teach all nations. No excuses, brothers and sisters. Remember, we Christians are diehards, guaranteed for eternal life. Amen.